Hello and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about bioinformatics pipelines. We're going to cover what they are and what they're used for, common steps in a bioinformatics pipeline, different ways you can build them. And finally, I'll guide you through a example of how you can build your own. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So firstly, what is a bioinformatics pipeline? Well, put simply, it's a series of orchestrated data processing steps where each step builds on the previous one in a bioinformatics analysis context, of course. These steps might include initial raw data pre-processing, data analysis, statistical tests, and finally, result interpretation and visualization. But why do we need a bioinformatics pipeline? Well, the scale of data we handle in bioinformatics is vast. We're often dealing with entire genomes, proteomes, or complex interactions between them. Manually processing such a high volume of data is not feasible or efficient. That's where these pipelines come in. They allow us to automate this process, handling the massive influx of data in a systematic and step-by-step -step manner. Besides handling large data, another significant advantage of pipelines is the reproducibility they offer. In research, it's crucial that our results are reproducible, meaning other researchers can follow the same steps and reach the same conclusion. Pipelines document each step of the data processing journey, ensuring that our work is transparent and can be accurately reproduced by others. So to summarize, a bioinformatics pipeline is an organized, automated system that allows us to process large-scale biological data and achieve reproducible results. Now that we understand what a bioinformatics pipeline is and why it's used, let's dive into the typical steps you might find in one of these pipelines. We'll be using a genomic sequencing pipeline as our guiding example. So the steps used in these pipelines can vary depending on the type of data and the goals of your project. But usually we start with a data collection. So the first thing we need to do is collect our raw data. So in a genomic sequencing pipeline, this data usually comes from a sequencing machine and consists of short DNA sequences, often referred to as reads. The next step is usually data pre-processing. So once we have our raw data, it's time for some cleaning. This stage involves steps such as quality control, where we check the quality of our reads and remove or correct any that are of low quality. Another critical step is read mapping, where we align our reads to a reference genome. Step three is data analysis. So with our pre-processed data in hand, we can now move on to the main analysis. In our genomic sequencing example, this stage includes variant calling. Step four is interpretation and visualization. So after identifying variants, the next step is variant annotation. Here we add information to each variant about its potential effects. Finally, we often want to visualize our results to aid in interpretation. This could be a plot showing the distribution of variants across the genome or a table summarizing the potential effects of each variant. So as we move through a bioinformatics pipeline, our data is transformed from raw reads into meaningful insights about genomic variations. Remember, the specific steps in your pipeline might vary depending on your project's needs. However, the overall structure will likely remain consistent uh, across different projects. You might be wondering why we call this process a pipeline. Well, consider a water pipeline. At the start, you have a source, which is similar to our raw data. As this water flows through the pipeline, it passes through various stages, filters, pressure regulators, branching pipes, all performing specific functions to ensure the water reaches its final destination in the desired state. In a similar vein, our raw biological data enters the bioinformatics pipeline and flows through distinct stages of processing. Each stage refines and enriches the data. So by the end, by the time our data has flowed through the entire pipeline, what began as a raw and somewhat chaotic flood of information has been harnessed and transformed into a steady stream of valuable, actionable insights. Right, we're now going to talk about how to actually build a bioinformatics pipeline. There's a few different ways. Let's start with the basics. Building a bioinformatics pipeline can often start with just simple scripting languages that you might already be familiar with, like Python, R, or Bash. At its core, a bioinformatics pipeline is a sequence of tasks where each task processes data and passes it on to the next. Now, each of these tasks can be performed by a script. For instance, you might have a Python script that pre-processes your data 
an R script that performs a statistical analysis, and then another Python script that visualizes the results. You can then put all these individual scripts inside a bash script to orchestrate the pipeline. The great thing about this approach is that it leverages the coding skills you might already have. So there's no need to learn a complex new tool to start building your pipeline. One thing to note is that when using this method, it's important to design your scripts to be command line friendly. What does this mean? Well, each script should be capable of taking an input directly from the command line and produce an output that can be automatically passed on to the next step. This can be done by saving the output to a file which the next script can read from, or in some cases, piping the output directly from one script to another in your bash script. By doing this, you're making sure that your pipeline runs smoothly from one step to the next. If you are confused how linking scripts together actually works, then don't worry because I'll be taking you through an example at the end of this video where you can build your own simple pipeline in this way. Although this approach is very powerful, there are some limitations too. As tasks become more complex uh, and the volume of your data grows, you may find that a bunch of linked scripts isn't enough. And that's where some more of these advanced tools come in, which we'll talk about in the next section. So the next way we can build bioinformatics pipelines is with a workflow management system. So as our tasks grow in complexity and our data sets increase in size, the need for tools designed to tackle these challenges also escalates. This brings us on to workflow management systems. Workflow management systems are designed specifically for managing complex data intensive computational pipelines. These tools offer features that can dramatically streamline the pipeline creation and execution process. The most common ones used in bioinformatics are Nextflow and Snakemake. So why might you choose these tools over your familiar, comfortable set of linked scripts? Well, the advantages are numerous. Firstly, they're modular. So if you think of each task in our bioinformatics pipeline as a building block, each block has a specific function like quality control or data analysis. And these blocks can be reused across different projects. In the context of workflow management systems, these blocks are called modules. So instead of writing a new script for every project, you can write a module once and then plug it into any pipeline that needs that task. This saves you valuable time and ensures a standard, consistent approach to each task, which is crucial in bioinformatics. The second thing is that they can handle large data sets with ease. As you may well know, bioinformatics deals with large and complex data sets. And these systems are designed with such data in mind, managing the data flow efficiently from one step to another. Thirdly, workflow management systems are built with error handling in mind. Your pipeline can fail gracefully if something goes wrong, saving you from the frustration of unpredictable crashes. Another major advantage is reproducibility. This is really important in bioinformatics. These systems require explicit definition of each step of your process, allowing anyone to replicate your pipeline and achieve the same results. Also, these tools provide many extra features for tracking the performance of your pipeline. I personally use Nextflow a lot, and I really like the summary reports you can get. You can get a nice visualizations showing things like CPU usage, RAM, and runtime for each step in the pipeline. This can be useful for optimizing your pipeline and managing resources efficiently. Plus, many of these systems come with pre-made pipelines for common bioinformatics tasks. And you can use these as a starting point for your own work. So let's say you wanted to run a whole genome sequencing analysis pipeline. You wouldn't have to build it from scratch. You could just use one of the pre-built pipelines as is, or at least you could use it as a starting point and then customize it to add some additional features if you needed. One thing to remember though, is that these systems come with a steep learning curve. It can seem intimidating, especially if you're new to bioinformatics, but don't let that dissuade you. Uh, if you're going to be building pipelines regularly, then I do recommend learning one of them because they do save you a lot of time and allow you to manage your, your data and projects more efficiently in the long run. So moving on, we have another approach, a third and final approach for building these bioinformatics pipelines, and that is using a graphical user interface or GUI. So a GUI like Galaxy offers a visually intuitive method for constructing and managing bioinformatics pipelines. So for those who are either new to coding or find it a bit intimidating, GUIs provide a user-friendly alternative. So this could be useful for wet lab biologists who aren't 
as adept in the coding themselves. So with Galaxy, you can drag and drop components to create a pipeline. This is an open source platform where you can create, run, and share bioinformatics workflows. It provides access to numerous bioinformatics tools, which you can use directly through the interface without actually having to write any code yourself. You can simply select the tool you want to use, provide the input, and Galaxy will execute the task for you. It's kind of like you have a team of bioinformaticians working behind the scenes, running the commands based on your instructions. Galaxy also has built-in data handling capabilities, which enables you to handle large data sets with ease. And one of the great features of Galaxy is its reproducibility. So it tracks every step you take, allowing you or anyone else to replicate the workflow exactly. That being said, while GUIs like Galaxy can be incredibly useful, they might not offer as much flexibility or control as scripting or using a workflow management system. They are fantastic for getting started and for standard tasks, but for more complicated or customized pipelines, you might find that other methods are more suitable. So in conclusion, the method you choose for building your bioinformatics pipeline will depend on a variety of factors, your coding skills, uh, the complexity of your tasks and the resources at your disposal. But regardless of the method you choose, the key lies in understanding your data, defining your tasks accurately and ensuring the reproducibility of your workflows. Okay, so in the second half of this video, I'm going to take you through building your own simple pipeline using the first method that I talked about in the video, um, which is basically linking together command line scripts within a bash script. So you've basically got this bash script which is acting as a kind of container which is gonna which is gonna contain all your other scripts. Um, and we're gonna go through a simple example today. So the, the example I'm, I'm gonna show you is, is very simple as I mentioned. It's not probably not gonna be something you're actually gonna be doing but that I'm doing that on purpose because I basically just want to have something which is going to be easy to understand because the main focus here is actually on how to actually build the pipeline, not necessarily the you know the bioinformatics like that's going on. So, in this simple example, we're going to build a pipeline that does three steps. So, the first step will be it downloads a gene expression dataset. Uh, the second step will be it calculates the mean expression for each gene across all the samples, and then finally we'll visualize the results with a histogram. So if we break this down, we're basically going to create four scripts. Um, one script for each of these three steps, and then one script, which is going to be the, the bash script, which we're going to put all these scripts inside of. So that, that's just um, demonstrated here. So we're going, we're going to have an R script, which is going to download the gene expression data. We're going to have another R script to calculate the mean expression for each gene. We'll then have a Python script to create the histogram. And as I mentioned, we're going to have finally this bash script, which is going to hold all the above scripts. So you might notice that the first two scripts are R scripts. And you might be thinking, why can't we just use a single R script to download the data and to calculate the mean expression? And the answer is, well, we can. But the reason I'm doing this and showing you um, like how to do it with two separate scripts is because it's best practice when building these pipelines to separate out different functionality into different scripts. So I remember when I first started to learn you know, how to build these pipelines and was using this method of linked scripts, but I tried to pack as much as I could into a single script. So I'd have like an R script that would download the data, do some pre-processing, do some like input validation, it would do all sorts of um, statistical tests and manipulation and then also do the visualization at the end and it would be this, I'd have this long script with like hundreds of lines of code and it would just be impossible to try and debug that. So that's, that's one of the reasons is, is debugging and just making your code cleaner but there are other reasons too. One of the other main reasons you would separate out you know different tasks into their own scripts is because it makes your code more reusable. So we, I mentioned before about making your code modular. So this, this is kind of what, what, what we're doing here. We're separating, out, we're separating out tasks into their own scripts. We're making them modular. And that way, we can take a script and reuse it in another pipeline. 
So let's say we have we had another pipeline which which would use the same sort of method to download the gene expression data, but it had you know a different downstream process. We could just we could reuse this first script um, in in that new pipeline. So if we combine these into into one script, we wouldn't be able to reuse it in the new pipeline because we'd be do we'd be doing something different in the second step. So making your code modular allows you to reuse parts. So if you know if you're going to be creating a lot of pipelines, it's just good practice. Um, it's good practice to do that. Okay, so I'm now going to take you through each of those four scripts I mentioned. So just to remind you, we've got the R script to download the data. We've got the second R script to calculate uh, the mean expression, and then finally an R script that will plot plot the the output. Sorry, a Python script, and then we have obviously that Bash script as well, which is which is going to be used as the container for all those other scripts. So that's these four scripts in this script fold I've got here. I will link all this code below, so if you want to uh, run this pipeline yourself or just take a look at the code, uh, I'll link my GitHub in the description. But let's start by looking at this bash script. So, so as I said, this is the script which is going to con contain all our other scripts. So this is kind of the main pipeline script, we've called it run pipeline, um, and a bash script has the file extension .sh. So I'm, I'm just going to assume um, you guys have minimal knowledge when building pipelines. I'm just going to try and explain everything the best I can. Um, so firstly, let me just zoom in. So the first thing we have at the top here is what we call a shebang line. And don't worry that it's in red. That's just because I have a special setting on in my text editor. But basically any file which is going to be executable will have a shebang line and what do I mean by executable that just basically means if you're running a script you know as a command line script so I'm in I'm in the terminal down here let me just list what's in here so I've got our four scripts and if I were to say like run run the pipeline script just like that so that's how you run a bash script by the way you do dot slash and then the name of the uh, of the script if I were just to run it like that I'd be running it as an executable any, any file that's run as an executable file meaning you just call it from the command line like like that it has to have a shebang line at the top and what this shebang line does it tells the operating system um, this it basically tells the operating system this is a script and here's what what you should use to run it so in in this case it's saying this is a script you should use bash to run it because this is a bash file and if I quickly just show you my Python file we'll see the similar thing it's basically saying this is a script use Python to run it in our R files it'll be like this is a script use R to run it um, hold on. Um, hopefully that, yeah but just just have that at the top if it's going to be run as an executable file right so the next thing here is we are setting some variables so these these lines here that I'm highlighting we're setting two command line arguments so this bash script is going to be it's going to take two command line arguments it's going to take firstly a directory so this is going to be where our output to the pipeline is saved and secondly it's going to take a data set ID and this data set ID is a GEO or GEO gene expression omnibus ID of a data set that's going to be downloaded by our pipeline bear with me um, I'm trying to think if I'm explaining this well enough but just bear with me basically we're you know we're setting a shebang line then we're setting two variables and these variables are coming from the command line let me just let me just show you what that this is going to look so when we run our pipeline we do as I mentioned before, dot slash the name of the file, and then we have to set two arguments. We have to set an output directory, and we have to set a dataset ID. So this is what that's going to look like in our case. So we're going to have. And by the way, when you when you have a bash script and you want to, or any script that you want to have command line vari variables, um, you basically just have a space between the file name and the first variable and a space between the, f in the, in the first variable and the second one and so on so you just have spaces between each thing so this will if we run this it's basically gonna think 
we've got the obviously the file to run and then we've got two command line arguments and now if I just quickly show you what's going on at the bottom here we're now basically running those three scripts so remember we've got one R script to download the data one R script to calculate the mean expression and then the Python script to, do, to make some plots for us and these these files they each have their own command line arguments so just as we're going to run down here this is how we're actually going to run our pipeline we also send some of these arguments some of these variables to our our scripts okay so we're now going to run this pipeline but before we do I'm going to activate a conda environment conda is just a package manager and I'll talk a bit more about best practices for managing packages for pipelines um, at the end of this video but for this very simple example I've just used a conda environment it's basically a way to containerize all the packages you've used in a certain project because obviously there's so many different versions of packages or programs that if you don't if you use different ones you might get different results but if you're running a pipeline for example let's say you know you run a pipeline with Python 3 versus Python 2 and you know you might maybe get errors or maybe it gives you a different result and the, you know there's tons of examples of this happening and re as I mentioned reproducibility is very important in bioinformatics so we need to keep track of all the packages and software versions we're using so I'm just going to activate this condo environment and you can tell it's activated when you get this at, at the start so now let's run the pipeline as I mentioned we first have the the first thing is the script so we have dot slash and then our bash script the second thing is a folder where we want the pipeline output to be oh yeah So in my case that will be one up from the current directory and let's just say pipeline out and then we're going to have a, f a third argument or, or sorry a second argument that um, is going to be the dataset ID of the geo dataset so I'll, I'll explain what this actually means later on you'll see but just for the sake of it I think it's best to show you how the pipeline actually works um, before we go into the other scripts so once you've done that, you're going to click enter and we should see a lot of output on the in the terminal just saying it's doing doing different things. And you you would have seen up here on, in the directory it's actually created this new pipeline out folder which is which is the folder that we set for our output directory. So as you can see it's worked. We've got three outputs, we've got some expression data, we've got the mean expression, then we've got this histogram. And yeah, this is not um, this is not a complex pipeline by any means, as I mentioned, but the point of this again is just to show you how to actually build them and how they actually work. So this is not too important, but I think now the next the best thing to do is to go through the rest of these scripts. So firstly we're going to show you this download data script so we're basically calling that from our bash script we say use R script if, if you're going to call an R script from the command line you have to put R script before if you're going to call a Python script from the command line you have to put Python before but the syntax here is you know R script the name the name of your script so the name of R script is download data to R and then any command line variables so remember we have to make our um, we have to make our scripts command line scripts to be able to take input um, from you know from a, either a previous step or from somewhere on the file system so let's have a look at this so download data as I mentioned we have this shebang line at the top that's telling the operating system this is a script and it's an R script so we need to run it with R script and then I'm not going to go too much into detail on this but I'm just going to at a high level what we're doing we're loading in some libraries we are checking that the command line variables have been uh, supplied so remember we, we need uh, two command line arguments here we need the output directory and we also need the dataset ID so it's basically checking that we have two command line arguments provided and if 
if, if we don't then it will throw this error so error handling is another important thing when you're building pipelines but um, and again we'll talk about that nearer to the end what we're doing here is we're basically taking those arguments from the command line we're setting them into variables and then we can use those variables um, in our in our code so this geoid this will there's this function which is part of the geo query library which you can pull data directly from the gene expression omnibus using this get geo function all you have to provide is the you know the string of the data set id um, and it and it'll kind of pull that uh, gene expression set into your code so that's what we're doing here and then you know again we're checking did it work you know if you if you provide a, a data set id that doesn't exist then it will probably it will probably throw an error at you so we're checking like did it work if it if it didn't work then we're gonna send this message back to the user and it's gonna help with debugging um, and then just in our case we're just taking the first data set and then we're rounding the, the expression values and then we're writing a CSV so we're, we're writing a CSV called a CSV called expression data dot CSV and if we look in our pipeline out folder over here we see that we've got our expression data dot CSV file so that's what that's what the, that's what the first script is doing now the second script and before we go to it I'm just going to show you back to our bash script the second script is another R script this time we're, we're going to calculate the mean expression with this R script called calculate mean expression dot R and it's going to take one variable which is the outdoor the same outdoor you know as we've supplied to our bash script and to our R script before so let's go to calculate mean expression again shebang line at the start telling our operating system this is a script it's an R script uh, loading in the packages testing that the that there is a command line argument um, and it's, it's then setting that command line argument to the out there variable it's then reading in the expression data so, so remember we've already created this in the, in the first R script and then it's calculating the mean across rows and then it's just writing it to a new file called mean expression.csv which again is here in our pipeline out folder okay so then the last thing is this python script so we're gonna so we we write python the name of our python file and then we any command on arguments that 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 script requires again so we're going to apply this out there we're going to pl apply this out directory command on argument and if I show you what this looks like, we've got the shebang line at the start. Loading and required packages. Checking that we've supplied a command line argument. We're then setting that argument to a variable. We're then reading in that file. And we're, we're using the, app, the variable, obviously, in our script. So here you can see we're, we're reading this mean expression.csv file from this outdoor folder, which is this pipeline out folder. We're then plotting the mean expression adding some labels and then finally we're saving this plot again to the outdoor variable which is pipeline out and we're going to call it mean expression histogram png and that is this file right here so again that's a very simple pipeline but i'm hoping how do i zoom out okay I'm, I'm hoping you have got an idea now of how these actually work and just one thing before we move on is that if I just list the so let me just clear this if I list the files in you know this folder here you can see that the run pipeline the bash file is in green and you know it's, it's not like the color isn't important but the reason it is that color is because that file is executable and when you first create this bash script let me let me pull it up again When you first create this bash script, it's not by default executable. So if you remember we said an executable file is a file you can just run from the command line. It's not something you you're not just like running it line by line in you know in like a in a terminal. You're actually running the whole file at once. So with our run pipeline script, this is how we run it as an executable file. Um, but the first time you create this file the first time you create this bash file it won't be an executable file so 
I just want to bring your attention to to kind of this part over here. So if you if you if you're in Linux and you want to list list your files in the directory, ls lt will list the files. You know, l will give you more information, and then t is just list them by the time they were created. Uh, but don't worry, don't worry about that. I just want to draw your attention to this part over here. This this part over here tells us um, a bit about a file. So there's three terms you'll see r w and x r is read w is write and x is execute so there are actually well from this first r there are actually nine different slots for each file and i'm actually going to zoom in over here can i zoom in hold on okay that's good enough so We've actually got nine slots for each of these files. Let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. And what this is basically telling us is read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, blank, X for this file. So we basically have three three groups of three. So the first three, the, th the first read, write, execute is for the user. So that's going to be like me in this case. Um, it's just like the person who's using it for me this file is I can read it I can I can write to it I can also execute it the second RWX read write execute is for is for a group so your administrator can or, or you can set this file to be only only you know accessible to a certain group of people like by their username and then the final three are for anyone else so everyone else so we've got you basically got you as the user, a, gr a group of predefined people, and then everyone else. So for me as the user, this file is readable, it is, I can write to it, and it's also executable. Whereas with the other files, I, could, they're, I can read them, I can write them, but they're not, they're not executable. So what I'm getting at here, uh, sorry for the long-winded explanation, but is that by default, when you first create this bash script, it won't be executable. So that this X here will be missing. So you have to make it executable yourself. And you use the ch mod command. So it'll be ch mod plus X. So you're basically adding the executable uh, and then the file name. So you, you just do the name of your bash your bash script. So in that case, it'll just be like that. And if I just relist those, you know, nothing's changed. But just to demonstrate how that this is actually working, let's let's say I wanted to make the download data script executable. I do exactly the same thing. I go chmod plus x, and then the name of this file. And now when I relist this, there should be two greens. Yeah. So again, the color doesn't matter, but it that the color tells well at least me for my terminal it tells me that a file is executable so you can see that that's actually worked and you can see that there's this X here now uh, on the left hand side so that's just something to be aware of like you don't need to make your R and Python scripts executable in, in this um, in this scenario because the shebang line actually handles that so the shebang line at the top of, of, of these files tells tells the operating it tells the operating system that it's a executable file and it should be executed with the, with as like an R script in this case but you will have to do it for your bash script so just be aware of that okay so I'm just gonna do a very quick summary because I know that was very all over the place but to summarize to create a, a pipeline with linked scripts you have one bash script which is going to act as the container for all your other scripts you need to you need to uh, use a shebang line, you set any command line variables that the pipeline is going to take and then within this you basically call your other scripts so these could be R scripts, these could be Python scripts, these could be other bash scripts you know other programming, other scripting languages could be used here but here you're basically calling your scripts inside of this inside of this bash file and you're also supplying your command line arguments and you're basically trying to make your code modular so each script should do a separate task. Uh, each script should you know, have a shebang line and it should have an output so in this case we're just writing to a file in a certain folder and then the next step is going to pick that up. Um, but in some cases you can if you have a bash script you can just use the pipe you can like pipe the output straight into into another into another like 
command um, but we're just going to keep it simple for now okay so this is the last part of the video I just want to go over some best practices because this is going to be important when you start building more complex pipelines so that example I just showed you it's very simple we didn't really need to worry about um, a lot of this stuff just because it's very easy to debug um, we didn't have to worry about package versions clashing or anything but this is important to mention um, if you are going to get serious about building these pipelines uh, this is just some stuff to bear in mind so I'm just going to quickly take you through this these are my pipeline best practices or commandments if you like so firstly error handling so you want your scripts to be able to handle errors gracefully uh, so if, if it crashes you don't want to have this complex error message and it's going to be difficult to debug uh, you want to you want it to handle them gracefully and the way you do that is basically you can you can raise errors in your code so you can do like you know try blocks in python try accept or you can do you know basic basic error handling within the actual scripts themselves so the, in the actual r and python scripts you want to do stuff like validate your input so if you're expecting um, maybe a CSV file as an input for some expression data you can validate you know the, the file extension is correct you can validate validate lots of different stuff um, you can also you know use like assertion statements in your code to check that you're getting the desired outputs but yeah as, as these pipelines get bigger you do want to be incorporating some error handling so I did some basic error handling in that pipeline just you know for example making sure that a script has the correct amount of command line arguments supplied uh, so the ne next one is logging um, this basically keeps track of the actions performed by your pipeline so do you remember when I ran the pipeline and on the terminal there was a log output that was just printed to the terminal um, a lot of that stuff could be useful just to see what's going on and you, you can actually like you know make that automatically be piped into a log file so a log file just you know keeps track of what the pipeline's doing uh, keeps track of the actions performed any errors or warnings or informational messages that's also going to be useful if you're debugging um, just making sure everything's working as as you think so python has the built-in logging module i think it's just called like logging and r has the futile logger package as well so they're good tools, um, but there's many like logging tools you can use, so worth doing some research into that. Okay, third one is input validation. Um, it kind of kind of falls under the same bracket as the error handling, but you know, just checking the inputs in the correct format contains the expected information. Uh, the next one is testing. So you want to write tests. So you might have heard of unit tests. So this is going to test that your pipeline is working as expected. So you, you basically create maybe a, a small a small test data set where you have the expected output that you can run through the pipeline and check it check it like creates that expected output and it doesn't even have to be through the whole pipeline you can run tests for certain scripts so maybe um, the data download script you can you can run a test um, with a example data set and just see if it, if that one script runs correctly so in python you've got pytest package and then in r you can use the test that package uh, just two of many okay the fifth is a version control so this is you know you want to be using something like github uh, to keep track of your code because you're going to be making lots of changes and you know it's just it's just standard practice and if you're developing any anything in, in terms of software or code you're going to want to use some sort of version control uh, management system like git and github that way you can always revert back to previous versions of code and you can have like many people working on a pipeline at once without having to worry about um, clashes or anything so that's just standard practice another thing is documentation so you want to document your pipeline thoroughly so that includes like comments within the code as well as a almost almost like methods document that explains right well, it depends like what you what you're using this for if you're going to share it with others then you probably want a methods document that's going to explain you know what 
what it does, what different tools are used, etc. Um, it will help you and others understand what the pipeline is actually doing and if you want to modify it down the line it makes it easier to do that. K7 is something we've covered a lot which is modular design. You want to keep each script you make to, to only only do a single task. So that means you can it's easier to debug and you can reuse modules uh, between different projects. Right, number eight is use a configuration file. So a configuration file can be used to store information. So in the example pipeline, we just had two command line arguments. You know, we had the output folder and we had the um, data set ID. But let's say you were running a pipeline that had like 10 command line arguments. You can just use a, single, a file, um, you know, a config file. It can be like, a, it could be a text file. It could be like a JSON or um, it doesn't really matter. But basically, you can have a file where you set the variables. So instead of having to type on the command line that long thing, you could just, you can just have, you know, you can type the, the name of your script and then the name of the file, and have the pipeline automatically pull the variables to pull the com command line arguments, which are now variables, from that configuration file. Um, yeah, so as you create bigger pipelines, this is best practice because it just saves saves you a lot of hassle working on the command line, um, and allows you to like quickly, you know, re if you if you want to rerun a pipeline with different commands, it just makes it a lot easier. Makes it a lot more reusable as well, I guess. Okay, the final thing here is package management. So as I mentioned, in this very simple pipeline, I used a I used a Conda environment. Um, and a Conda environment is, if, if you're new to package management, it's basically, how can I describe it? So imagine your computer, if you just downloaded packages, normally you'd probably just what, download them to your computer and they'd just be on the system, right? You can think of a Conda environment as like a mini, a mini environment within the main environment that is your operating system. So within that environment, you can have different packages so let's say you have like python 3 downloaded onto your operating system you could have python 2 downloaded in that conda environment and then you can run the pipeline within that conda environment so it's you're running it within a kind of a kind of container that has all the packages you require that's probably not the best way to go about it if you're going to build you know bigger bigger pipelines because it's probable that different steps within your pipeline require different packages. So, you know, let's say stage one of your pipeline requires a version of an R package that's different from stage ten of your pipeline. You couldn't that you couldn't just have your Conda environment um, with different versions of different versions of that package. What you the best practice in that case is to use different environments for each process. So for each step in each script in our pipeline, each one would use a different environment. And you may have heard of something like uh, called Docker. So Docker is, um, it, it's a similar concept to a Conda environment, except that it's not just, it's not just like um, a separate container. It's almost like a separate operating system, like a mini, lightweight operating system that can have you know it can have it can be any operating system it could be like a linux different it can be linux like debian ubuntu um it could it could be like windows it could be any you can have it it can be any operating system in a in this like lightweight container that has its own packages as well i think i might have butchered that explanation a bit but but the take home is you can basically have each step in your pipeline to have to run in a different container and a, a different environment, a different, you know, each step in the pipeline can have access to its own versions of packages. Um, and as you scale up and build bigger pipelines, this is like the best practice to use Docker uh, or Singularity. Singularity is an, uh, an alternative to Docker. Okay, that's it for this video. Um, hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, drop a comment below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, so without further ado, thank you for listening and watching and I'll see you in the next video.